Section 6 of Association Football and How to Play It. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section 6, Chapters 12 and 13. Chapter 12, Present-Day Football. There are not wanting signs that football has not yet finished expanding. Every season sees more clubs in villages as well as in towns, and the county associations also report a numerical increase. But whether or not there will be a sharper dividing line between amateur and professional is difficult to say. It may be that before long we shall have one authority for the amateur game and another for the professional. It must not be forgotten that there are tens of thousands of the one class, but only a few of the other. But the paid player, by reason of the leisure he has, shows the highest skill, and in that way has inspired the unpaid with a higher ideal of play and it is a favourite contention of many that the best game is that played by the professional clubs. The junior who goes to see Aston Villa, Chelsea, Manchester United or Newcastle is impressed by the play and makes up his mind to try and put into practice what he has seen. It is good for the boy to go and see the players of the highest skill, and if the ordinary club member would do this occasionally, the average standard of play would be higher. A boy who is an enthusiastic right back and is anxious to play in that position can hardly do better than go and watch Robert Crompton, the famous right back of the Blackburn Rovers. He is an example of what our elementary schools produce. As a lad, he took part in the game at Moss Street Board School, an institution that had produced a side that had carried off the trophy offered to the schools. When at work as a plumber, he played in the league team of a Sunday school, and when engaged one day was seen by Mr. John Lewis, who got him to play for the Rovers. For some couple of years he remained an amateur, but then became a professional. He became captain in 1899 and has several international caps. He uses his head and tries to anticipate the intentions of his opponent. He kicks with either foot with great power and is a clean player. He follows the ball rather than the man. He is an excellent example of the man who, taking to football, has found it possible to stick to his trade as well. Another player is James Sharp, who is a splendid outside right. In him you have a reminder that skill may make up for lack of inches. He is only 5 feet 7 inches, but he is one of the men who have worked hard to attain their position, and also to keep it. He can dribble well, feint, pass, shoot, and yet keep control of the ball. He came from Hereford, where he was a member of the local club, and after two seasons went to Everton. In his every action you can see the man who plays for his club. He is determined and strong, given to making the most of an opportunity. It's difficult for the adversary to know what he is going to do. Here is the ideal all-round sportsman. Little wonder he has succeeded so well on the cricket field. He is not content to excel in one department. Once we thought he would become a great fast bowler. Then he began to progress as a batsman, and at the moment of writing has concluded a great season for his adopted county, whose fortunes have been very low. He too is in business, and life for him is truly strenuous as his play is. We could do with more player workers of this modest young man's type. And. If you come to the front line, watch V.J. Woodward, our leading gentleman player. The son of an architect living in a house that overlooks the Oval, he learned his game at school at Clacton, and then resided at Chelmsford, where one day a sporting director of the Spurs, happening to know that a match was being played in the County Cup competition, thought he would have a look, and did so. He was struck with the skill of Vivian J. Woodward as a center forward, and as the result of a chat, he was got to play for Tottenham Hotspur. This was some six years ago. He at once made his mark, and no man was ever so loved by professionals. No fairer player ever stepped onto the field. Note his clean, delightful runs, how unselfish he is. Indeed, it was freely reported that he was left out of a series of internationals because he showed so much consideration for his partners. What a glorious tribute to the sportsmanship of the man. Yes, for a clean, clever, I cultured forward play. Watch V.J. Woodward, who can only get away on Saturdays because he earns his living. He is a grand wicket-keeper and cricket captain who has not the time for county games. And 
he is a genuine amateur no riding third class and charging first he is an honorable performer who looks to all to play a clean game and expects the referee to see they do if such amateurs are to be driven out of the soccer game by money-making limited liability companies and their unending squabbles it will be a bad day for sport you can still see needham old i suppose as players go what a strategist he is his play is that of the man who loves the game he can still tackle pass defend and shoot as finely as of old of goalkeepers one can see many ashcroft sutcliffe lunn of wolverhampton hardy of liverpool maskery of derby county are all good there are many misconceptions about the game and most people think that the referee is compelled to use a whistle but if you read the laws of the game or the directions to referees you find that nowhere is he instructed to use a whistle the word is signal but it might be by a trumpet or a motion of the hands or arms when the referee signals by whistle or otherwise at the commencement of the game it means that he is ready and the players can start as soon as they like but the period of play is counted from the actual kick the offside rule is very difficult for the spectator talk to them and they will tell you confidently that no player can be offside if he has three of the opposition in front of him that is nearer to their goal yet as mr william pickford has pointed out a player could be offside with eleven opponents in front of him it's not likely but it could happen if a player has not three opponents in front of him when the ball was last played by one of his own side who was behind him he is offside and he remains so till someone else plays the ball and if in the interval the rest of the team ran back on goal he would still be offside again what is an amateur well conscience will decide in the light of the rule he must not receive remuneration or consideration of any sort above his necessary hotel expenses and traveling expenses actually paid the men who pay for their sport are getting fewer and fewer it is a pity but on these and many other points you can obtain valuable booklets from the fa 104 high holborn london w c they also publish a referee's chart with the interpretation that is officially put upon many rules they are mines of useful information for those who know but little of the game it would seem as if the game is rapidly spreading on the continent and every country takes up the sport save turkey and russia england is the mentor and the football association have done great work it may be that the love of sport will so grow that ere many years are over we shall see several european teams competing here year by year in the early stages of the development the game will be amateur but later on will come the paid player one writer says no money no first-class football this is rubbish it's much to be regretted such a sentiment for we can get the highest skill from those who play for the love of the game the giants of the past who created the present demand were unpaid and the future will still produce those who will not play for gold Chapter 13. A Few Famous Cup Ties The English Cup is probably a bigger attraction to a footballer than any other. To a Scottish footballer, his international cap against England is to achieve the height of his ambition, but somehow in England, to participate in the final at the Crystal Palace in April is the heart's desire of the average player. There is a glamour surrounding the English Cup competition that nothing else can compare with. I well remember when the Scottish clubs were entitled to enter into the arena, and such great clubs as Queen's Park, Glasgow Rangers, Cowlers, Heart of Midlothian, entering in the lists against the best clubs that prevailed at the time in England. Queen's Park, still the premier amateur club in Scotland, also the Heart of Midlothian, made history in this competition, but the first named must be given the laurels. There are still many old players in Scotland who maintain that in the first year, when they were beaten by Blackburn Rovers, the result should have gone the other way. As it was before my day, I cannot naturally go into the matter as thoroughly as I should desire. But when such players as Messrs. Smelly and Campbell 
have assured me that they should have had the victory, I rather feel inclined to believe their statement. Queen's Park, as already stated, were for many years the greatest club in Scotland, and they played the game for the love of it, for when in the two finals which were played at the Oval, most of their members had to travel overnight to play on the following day, which speaks for itself. A great deal has been said as well as written about this matter, and it is often asked if the Queen's deserved to win. Perhaps the finest cup tie that has been seen at the Palace was the meeting of Everton and Aston Villa in 1897. I had thought at one time to participate in this final, but after playing three rounds I got knocked out, and was unable to play. I must say that my substitute at centre-forward did exceedingly well, and I could not grumble in any way at being left out. The ordinary London man will always remember this match, when the Villa eventually finished winners by three goals to two. I followed it very keenly, and in one way my sympathy went to the losers, because there was little or nothing to choose between them. Coming to Southern clubs, probably Southampton have been the most disappointed club that has come into the list, especially through their great cup tie with Knott's Forest at the Crystal Palace in the semi-final of the cup. A great amount of correspondence was entered into at the time, and everybody really admitted that they were most unlucky to be beaten at the last minute in a blinding snowstorm. Many people will remember how this tie was stopped in the middle of the game, and after resuming it with only a few minutes before the finish, the result was a draw. At almost the last moment, Knott's Forest broke away and scored a goal which many people considered should never have been allowed simply because they did not see it. The snowstorm was heavier than when the referee stopped the game earlier on, but he allowed it to go on because he expected the game would result in a draw. Whether this is correct or not I cannot say, but the fact remains that the good people of Southampton still maintain that they had not had their dues on that day. Something has been written of late about a goalkeeper letting his side down in a final tie, but I cannot believe that any player, whether goalkeeper or forward, could or would let his side down. I do not care to enter into the year when my old club, Tottenham Hotspur, won the cup, but one of the biggest officials in the Football Association came along to compliment me and said that my side gave the best display of football since Aston Villa won the cup. Indeed, he implied that it was even better than that given by the Villa, which compliment I naturally appreciated. It was indeed a great day at the Palace, and I do not propose to dwell upon the goal allowed by Mr. Kingscott to our opponents. Our players were sure that the ball had not crossed the line, but as we won on the replay at Bolton, everything was forgiven and forgotten. Another great match in the early days was at Manchester, between Everton and Wolverhampton Wanderers. Everton, the previous Saturday, had sent a reserve team to Wolverhampton. They won quite easily. I cannot say what the score was, but it was four or five goals to nothing. In the final at Manchester, Everton were eventually beaten by a long shot in the early part of the game. There was no doubting their superior skill, but this result simply proved that cup tie football is quite different from league football. There are two clubs in the South that have brought Southern football to the front, Southampton and Tottenham Hotspur. To the latter, all due credit must be given for winning the cup, but the Saints, as they are called, have done equally as good work as the Spurs. They were really the pioneers of professional football in the Southern League, and when one considers they were in the final in 1900 and again in 1902, when they were beaten by Sheffield United after a drawn game, it reflects great credit upon them. They do not receive the credit they deserve from their own supporters, and the severance of two of their best local players in 1906 was a severe handicap to the team. And by the way, they were both born and bred in the district, and caused a great sensation in the league. Perhaps one of the biggest surprises in the finals of the English Cup was the great victory of Bury over Derby County. The former won by six goals to nothing, but this was entirely due to Fryer being far from fit to play and letting the first three goals go past him. If his knee had been all right, it would never have happened. My old friend Charlie Campbell often talks of his old cup tie experiences and sometimes has referred to the meetings of his old club, Queen's Park, with Knott's Forest and Blackburn Rovers. In my early days, Mr. Campbell was to my mind quite a hero. He would go out of his way to advise and encourage juniors, 
and much of my success at Queen's Park and Everton was due to the advice which he gave me in those days. Talking about Tottenham Hotspur in the year they won the Cup, practically the best victory was over Bury, who were the holders of the little pot at that time. There was more enthusiasm shown over that match than I consider has been seen during any other cup tie that I have ever played in. The game was fought in a proper spirit, and when Bury scored in the first few minutes, it was thought that all was over regarding Tottenham's chances. However, we got exceedingly well together and won by two goals to one, amidst the greatest enthusiasm. It outshone the reception after the Bolton match, our victory over Reading, and all other great games the Spurs have distinguished themselves in. It is not for me to dwell upon the great reception the Spurs had on their return from Bolton. The only regret is that they have not won the Cup again, nor has any other Southern club had that honour. Southampton, as well as Spurs, have done much to uphold the prestige of the South in the Cup, and it now behooves the other clubs to gird themselves for the fray and demonstrate that Southern football is quite capable of holding its own against the North. The winning of the Cup by a Southern club next April would be the best possible proof of this. End of section 6